So glad you've chosen to worship with us today, and we've got a lot going on, so Joelle, take it away. Our sermon series for the summer begins today. It is called Remedial, so we're glad that you're joining us for that. It'll go through almost to the end of July, not quite, to the 22nd. And also we want to remind you that we have a wonderful new Sabbath school starting up today and the new family ministry building at 1030 in room 2404. Come out and check it out. It's from the School of Religion. We've also been announcing this for several weeks, but there is another divorce care program. If you need that, it starts July 11. Registration is required. And if you're kind of hesitating, we really encourage you if that's something you need, so many people that have participated in and have expressed how helpful it was. So that starts July 11, but you do need to register. So go to our website, LOUC.org. Loma Linda Academy is doing something really great. For those of you who are interested in checking out Christian education this summer, July the 17th and the 18th, they will be giving tours where you can ask questions, see the campus. It'll really be awesome for those of you who have been contemplating it, considering it. So if you would like more information on how you can be involved with this, go to our website and you'll find the details there. We've been announcing it for several weeks now and we'll be giving more information in the future. The Loma Linda Institute of Worship are the launch in August 9 through 12. But today we wanna highlight a concert. Steve Green is coming, it's August 11 and it's at 7 p.m. right here in the sanctuary. Tickets are required, so I want you to go to our website, LOUC.org, and find out more information about that. This is part of the Institute of Worship. We really hope you'll put that on your calendar, and tickets are available now for Steve Green coming August 11 at 7 p.m. right here in the sanctuary. Adriana and Josh have put so much time and energy into it. It'll be a wonderful, wonderful time. Absolutely. Well, we have something coming up that we all look forward to every year, and that is camp meeting. There are some really neat things that are going to be happening this year. And here is our beloved senior pastor, Randy Roberts, to give you those details. I always look forward to camp meeting. I do so even more this year and at a deeply spiritual level. This year, our focus is the book of Revelation. For about the last year and a half, I've been doing a deep dive into Revelation, and it has been transformative in my own life. I hope you plan to join us. Maybe this book says something different in some ways than we've always thought it said. Maybe Jesus really is revealed here. Maybe we truly do encounter the character of God. In fact, maybe the message of Revelation is captured in this series title and subtitle, Heaven Cares, the Tender God of the Apocalypse. This year, Camp Meetings is expanded. It begins a week early and ends a week late. And so we are seven weeks instead of five. Please plan to join us beginning Sabbath, July 29. Join us the evening before and every Friday evening for Revelation events led by Pastor Miguel Mendez and others. It promises to be a deeply special time. Revelation, this camp meeting. Just want to make a highlighted note that camp meeting starts one week early. It starts in July and it's going to be a great, great camp meeting. So I'm really looking forward to that. Well, that's our announcements for today. For the latest information, go to our website, LLUC.org. This is a holiday weekend for those of you here in the United States, 4th of July. We hope you have a wonderful Sabbath, a great 4th of July, and just a reminder to keep up your Bible reading plan. I know that it gets a little overwhelming this time of the year, but pick it back up, read your Bibles, and have a beautiful Sabbath day. We love you guys.
Good morning, and happy Sabbath to you. I'm one of the pastors for the senior ministries. I'm Daryl Retzer, and it seems like summer is finally here, and the warm weather is coming and has come. And as I look at my roses, I think, wow, they're really doing well. And I've heard some of you say the same thing about yours. In May, we had a group from Senior Ministries that went and visited Huntington Library and Gardens. And I want to thank Sharon Harder for sharing some of her pictures with us here. And uh, we want, uh, the roses were fantastic. And as we look at them and see the beauty, I'm reminded of the song in the garden. I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses. And the chorus goes on, and, the, uh, and he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me, finish that for me, tells me I am his own. And we belong to him. And he wants to have us have a personal relationship with him. And that's why we are here today, to celebrate the Sabbath and worship our Maker, the God of creation. And whether you're in the sanctuary here or viewing online, we want to say welcome to Loma Linda University Church. Welcome to worship. Join us in singing more about Jesus.
Let us bow our heads for prayer. Our good and gracious God, creator of the universe, sustainer of this world, head of this church, we come to you today in prayer to ask more, more of you, more about Jesus. Help us to grow, to be closer to you. We offer this community of faith, this church to you in prayer, this church that's full of paradoxes, a church that is both mighty and meek, weighty and weak, triumphant and troubled, because it's filled with we, people who are paradoxical. We're both sinners and saints, fragile jars of clay that you have somehow called to do incredible works. So today, we begin by offering our confession to you, to ask for your forgiveness and your healing. We confess that we are broken, that we are fragile, that we are sinners, that throughout this past week, we haven't always lived up to the high calling that you've placed before us. Forgive us, make us new, and fill us with your power so that even when we are afflicted, we will not be crushed. Even when we are perplexed, we will not be destroyed. Help us to carry you within us so that your life may be manifested through us. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Happy Sabbath, brothers and sisters. Oh, that sounds pretty good, but it's about noon now. We can get, we can get a little bit more activity than that. Happy Sabbath, brothers and sisters. Happy there we go. Amen. You know, David said, Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good and his mercy endureth forever. We have so much for which we can be thankful today. And the most important thing is that we serve a risen Savior who is in the world today, and he has allowed each of us to come into his presence with blood flowing warmly in our veins to give him adoration and praise. That should make at least two people say amen, hallelujah. Amen, amen. You know, a few weeks over the past few weeks, we came to you asking you to give a little extra support toward our church budget. Now, I say extra because you're already faithfully giving to this church on a continuous basis, and we are appreciative for that. You know, we want to just give a special thank you to this church for what you have done. You have gone beyond what we even thought was possible. You have given so generously over these past few weeks. We are tremendously, tremendously appreciative for your support. In the weeks to come, we're going to give you a little more detail and explain a little more to you about this. But just for now, the pastoral staff and the board want to express to you how grateful we are for your generosity, for reaching out and for going beyond what we even thought was possible, as I said before. And that's not only for those of you who are present, but for those of you who are online as well, we appreciate all of you for the support of this church. What it shows is that you have a tremendous and firm belief in the ministry and the mission of this church. Someone say amen. And speaking of mission, as many of you know, this coming week, the UReach department, under the direction of Pastor Linda Mendez, they're going on a mission trip to Kenya. We want you to keep them in your prayers, and we thank you for your support of that ministry. We thank you for your support of all of the wonderful ministries of the church, of the Loma Linda University Church. Someone say amen again. One of the, my favorite tunes is a little song that says, We give thee but thine own. Whatever the gift may be, all that we have is thine alone, a trust, O Lord, from thee. 
May God continue to bless each of us as we invest not only in time, but also for eternity. May God bless you. At this point in our worship service, we want to pause and recognize somebody who is integral to Loma Linda University Church. In fact, this is an individual whose name, when it is mentioned, is almost synonymous with LLUC. It is none other than our organist, Kimo Smith. There are so many things that make Dr. Kimo Smith a genius. One of my favorite things is that he can be idiomatic in the piano, or organ, he can play classical, he can play gospel, you name it, and it's always great. And he always makes it look like it's easy, but it's not. Kimo has this ability to transition from one piece to another. Sometimes he change keys, sometimes he doesn't, and it's very hard to know because of the harmonic progressions he uses are so beautiful and so tasteful. We all know Kimo is a genius musician, but to me, Kimo is much more than that. Kimo is 
a friend. Um, he is someone who shows a tremendous amount of empathy when he interacts with the choir members, with me on the podium, um, even off the podium. One of the things I love the most about Kimo is his sense of humor. And I know behind the scenes, there are only a few of us who get to experience his sense of humor. And it is so much fun. He catches me off guard every time, and we have such a great time bantering back and forth. I trust him implicitly and just value his friendship and musicianship more than words can ever describe. Right around this time, could be on this very day, but right around this time, Kimo celebrates 44 years of service to Loma Linda University Church. I'd like to offer just three or four reflections on Kimo that I have profoundly appreciated over the years. First of all is Kimo's commitment to this local congregation. Yes, he's our organist. Yes, he plays not only at our worship services, but at our concerts. He also plays at our weddings, at our funerals. It's a commitment to this local congregation. This isn't, as they say, a professional gig. This is Chemo's church. I deeply appreciate that. Secondly, I appreciate Chemo's commitment to excellence. Chemo and excellence are synonymous, just like Chemo and University Church. We have become so accustomed to that that all it takes is a visit elsewhere to realize we are awash in riches with Chemo's talents. Thirdly, I am profoundly appreciative of Chemo's commitment to collegiality, to connection, it's an honor for me to say that Kimo is a friend. Kimo, I want to especially to you today say thank you for leading the way with stellar service, committed service, for a tenure that is unmatched in Adventism and probably, in all honesty, in Christian ministry overall. We are so honored and privileged to have you as our pianist and organist at Loma Linda University Church. Thank you. I'm so grateful for who you are and for who you are in my life. Thank you so much for being chemo. We know that the choir celebrated your birthday last week, but today we want to celebrate your 44 years of service with the congregation here, and also I'm sure that there are many uh, giving you a hand online. Thank you for everything that you are and you do for music ministry. And we would like to have a prayer of thanksgiving at this point. Father in heaven, thank you very much for everything you are, and especially we want to thank you for Kimo, for his ministry, for his heart for worship, his heart for people, for being an instrument of peace and joy in this church. Thank you very much for his dedication and his commitment to excellence in everything he does. He's such a blessing. And we ask you, Lord, that he will continue to minister in this church for many years. Thank you, God, because you give us the opportunity to make music for your glory. We cannot wait until we will be face to face worshiping you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Wow, my heart is, is just very full right now. <clears throat> With gratitude to my colleagues, to Pastor Randy, to you. Many years ago, I was very sick and in the hospital and my dad sat next to my hospital bed. 
And at that time, he, he just was there constantly. And he prayed to God that if I were healed, that he would dedicate my life to his service. And so I just want to thank you, my congregation, my family, my church family, for giving me the opportunity to honor my dad, to um, serve God, and to serve you in this way. Thank you so much. Boys and girls, it is now time for the Lamb's Offering and soon to be a story. Today's Lamb's Offering will be going to Adventist Education. Having been a recipient of Adventist Education for the last 22 years, I just want to say thank you to all of you. When I was younger, my family needed the support. In high school, I had to do my part but it was because of the contributions of people that I have never met in my life, or maybe have seen once, that I was able to attend an Adventist boarding school. And here I am, one month since graduation, wondering if I'll ever be in class again. Maybe as a teacher, hopefully not as a student. Thank you so much. Each one of you, you don't know the impact of what the the dollar bills, the time that you invest, even the impact of the community that has been serving Loma Linda University students at Wednesday at 6 p.m. It might not just be the money, sometimes it's the time that has been so effective in Adventist education. So thank you so much for each one of you. I'd love to join in because your faith has shown itself in my life and I want to do the same thing to the next generation. Hello, boys and girls. My name is Gus. And I wish I could know all of your names right now, but we don't have enough time to do so. But I was hoping if anyone here who is seven years old can raise their hand. Yes, we have a couple seven-year-olds. Well, my story today is going to be from when I was seven years old. So imagine me, about your height, and with a lot less hair, and then will be able to tell this story. The story begins at the store Target. I'm gonna, I'm, I think you've been to Target, right? Have you been to Target? Yeah? I see a nod. Then let's continue. My favorite part of Target growing up was the checkout line. Because at first, the conveyor belt, when you see all the groceries moving like magic, it's amazing. But after a while, the conveyor belt gets boring. The cooler part of the exit line is all the candies on the other side. Oh my goodness, you have Snickers bars, you have just sweet candies, and then at the top you have the golden candy, gum. It lasts so long. And so as a kid, I just loved kind of longingly looking, knowing that my parents would not be giving me gum or a Snickers bar. Maybe your parents do. And I'd like to <laughs> be their children too. So there I was, seven years old, looking at this. And wow, that gum looks amazing. I mean, oh, it's green, smells like mint. What's better than having gum and just having great breath. There's nothing in here, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, 
We get out of the checkout line, we go home, and it's time to go to sleep. So early, when I was younger, I would fold my clothes. My room was very clean. Not so much now, but it was impeccable. And while I was folding my jeans, I felt a little thing in the pocket. And I pulled it out of the pocket, and it was a pack of gum. I don't remember how it got there. I mean, I promise you, I wasn't stealing it. But there it was. There it was in my pocket. I was not supposed to get this gum. So what did I do? I opened it, took the wrapper off, and had a piece. Because after all, I didn't steal it. I don't remember stealing it. And so while I'm chewing, it is amazing. I mean, free gum is great. You don't have to buy it. But about 10 seconds in, the guilt started coming in. I started feeling shame. I started feeling these feelings where I couldn't go to my sister and say, hey, here's some gum. Do you want to share? I couldn't go to my mom and say, here's some gum, mom. Let's share. No, no one could know about this. So you know what I did with that piece of gum? You know in school, underneath the desks or underneath the table, have you felt like gum underneath the table? No? no. no? Oh my goodness. Well, the school I went to, yes, there was always gum underneath. Because if the teacher said, hey, no gum, you had to put it somewhere. And it's not going in your pocket. And so I took the gum in my room and I, I put it where I thought no one would find it. I tried to hide it in the very corner of my room in the closet. And so I started building a little pile of gum. Just I would chew it and I'd put a little pile in the depths of the closet. Two weeks later, mom comes to my room and she's putting clothes away and she sees the little pile of gum. Now at this point, I have been, I've been feeling terrible, so guilty, so bad for what I've done. And she sees it. And all of a sudden, I felt really good. I mean, I knew that I was kind of in trouble, but I didn't have to hide the secret anymore. And it felt amazing. You know what? Adam and Eve, when they ate the fruit and they felt all of a sudden ashamed, they felt guilty, they felt like they needed to hide from God. And God came around and he was like, Adam, Eve, where are you? And they were too scared to be there and to see him when all along he wanted to be there and to know them. I want to tell you a, a word that you might already know. But as you continue growing up, you're going to hear about doing good and doing bad. You're going to hear about evil and you're going to be hearing about sin. But one very important message that the story has of Adam and Eve and that, this, that applies to you today is that Jesus is looking to reconcile. Can you say that word with me? Reconcile. 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 He wants to come back. He wants you to go to him. And so if you do something and if you're feeling guilt, if you're feeling shame, Jesus is looking for you to come to him and just tell him, hey, I did this. And it feels so much better than keeping it hidden and keeping it a secret. Because at the end of the day, he doesn't want to be separate from you. And that will be a better feeling than hiding something away and keeping it secret. So kids, in the future, and as you learn, you'll hear more about sin, but remember, reconciliation is the key. So you can go now to your chairs or to your pews with your family and look for the gum in the aisle. Just buy it next time.
Our scripture reading today is taken from the book of 1 John, chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. It reads, See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. All who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. But you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins. And in him is no sin. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. I want to thank my good friend Paul Maxwell before you, before you run out of here, Paul. Every time I hear Paul speak, I feel like I'm at home with that New England flair that he possesses. I've decided, and don't quote me on the theological correctness of this statement, that if I'm wrong, and when we get to heaven, we don't all speak Spanish, then for sure we will speak English with a New Englander accent. I find a challenge uh, addressing you today, and that is that I want to talk about an issue that perhaps is a bit thorny. And all morning, I've been, I've been thinking what the best way to enter into the space is. And a few moments ago, I had this beautiful experience that I want to share with you. This just happened right now. I walked in to the office back here in the church, and amidst the hustle and bustle that is our campus on a Sabbath morning, it was completely silent and quiet. And I find it so fascinating that there is this space of silence in the midst of our campus as we sing beautiful anthems and we celebrate with prayer and praise. It reminds me a little bit about uh, the book of Revelation. You know that well and oft quote passage, Revelation chapter 4? Jesus is being magnified. The whole choir of heaven is singing, holy, holy, holy. They're singing, worthy is the Lamb. And as they conclude this beautiful enthronement celebration, John says that there's silence in heaven for half an hour. And I'm often puzzled by that statement, and then it just struck me as I was walking into church that there is something renewing about silence. There is something that reorients us about in silence. And so I think, and you get to be the guinea pigs because this is the fourth time we do this today, I think that the best way to start today is by holding some space for silence, just for the briefest of moments, and really allowing the presence of Christ to be embodied in this place. That was my gift for you introverts in the congregation today, those extroverts of you you can now breathe, we're back in conversational mode. Now, I wanna start our time together by telling you two things. The first one is we are going to be living and experiencing the text today as it is found in the first epistle that John writes to his church. We're going to be looking at verses one through six of the third chapter as so was marvelously read by, by Paul. The second thing that I need to tell you is that in order to do this Faithfully, we perhaps need to spend just some brief time talking about, well, talking about you and me. And what I mean by that is that we often spend a lot of 
time debating about these questions and answers that we are 100% sure about. I'm, I'm going to guess that at some point in your life, you've had a debate or a discussion with somebody, and you are so sure that you are correct that that debate drove a wedge in the relationship. Now, I'm not talking about issues of preference or these quirks that we all have, or maybe these, well, these obsessions that make you uniquely you. Now, I'm talking about the real questions, the questions that you are sure you know the answer to. And questions like, is it better to open your gifts on Christmas Eve or Christmas morning? Those of you who do it on Christmas morning, sorry to say, you are wrong. It's Christmas Eve. Or what about this one? This, ha this one happens at my home a lot. Um, do you, what do you do with ketchup? Do you store ketchup in the fridge? There's one person, two people, a couple of you. How many of you store ketchup in the cupboard? For shame. Well, if that's caused a wedge in your relationship, just know this. Heinz just tweeted this this week. Ketchup is supposed to be kept, wait, ready for it, in your fridge. Those of, us, those of you who keep it in your cupboard enjoy food poisoning. <laughs> but perhaps... No issue that is hotly contested at home has created more wedges, more strains, more frayed relationships than the following. I would venture to guess that you are one of two people. If you identify with the picture that is going to appear behind me in a moment, congratulations. You are a righteous man or woman. You are a true son or daughter of God. Well done, you are a person after my own heart. This is the right way to live. <laughs> the problem is not all of us are that type of person. There's sadly this other kind of creature living out there. It is my feeling that some of you might be even in this sanctuary that identify with this. And if that's you, you've come to the correct place. There is forgiveness. <laughs> there is grace. We're going to pray for you. And we're not going to touch you because that's just nasty, but we're going to pray for you. As I started thinking about these things that I was so sure about, these answers to questions that I am 100% convicted of, I started to think that we spend a lot of time worrying about these things. You know, just this last week, my son and I went to run some errands, and my eldest is really into reading right now, and so he turned the light in the cabin of my car, and he started reading a book. You know, we're driving through down the street, and I turn and I tell him, son, you need to turn the light off. He says, why? I said, well, it's illegal to have the light of your cabin on as you drive. He tells me, no, it's not. I tell him, yes, yes, it is. And so as any civilized pair of people, we settled our debate the only way you can. We, we went to the Internet Turns out it's not illegal <laughs> to have your light on as you drive. My parents were either just cheap or they didn't want me to read while they were driving because I grew up believing this. You know what else I grew up believing? 100% sure that if you ate a watermelon and you swallowed the seeds, <laughs> ah, you too that a watermelon would grow in your, in your stomach. <laughs> and I was so devastated by this church because I realized that I have spent so much time of my life worrying about the seeds that I haven't enjoyed the sweetness. And that has robbed me of some marvelous moments. 
You know what else was really overrated since I'm on this, on this already and I just thought about it? Quicksand. So if you, read a, if you read a book or you watched a cartoon, you watched a movie, you knew that the great threat to people that were adventurers in the forest or the jungle wasn't malaria or animals, the big chaos of the time isn't hate speech or global warming, it was quicksand. And I can't tell you how many Sabbath hikes I had that were interrupted by this petrifying fear that somehow I would step into quicksand. And you chuckle. But the reality is, so many people of faith Good people, moral people, people who are attempting to follow God in the best way they can, have failed to enjoy the journey because of the quicksand and to savor the sweetness because of the seeds. And so we're starting a new sermon series this summer. And the point of it is to go back to basics to these questions that you are sure you have the answer to, to these concepts that we are certain we understand. And the hope is that somehow, some way, we can see the seeds and notice the quicksand through the lens of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And at the outset, I have to tell you, this isn't to say that we are Pollyannish. It would be irresponsible for me to tell you that there is no brokenness in the world, that there is no suffering, that pain doesn't exist. What I can tell you, though, is that those experiences are felt in markedly different ways when you have the capacity to see them through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. So what are some of these stories that we tell each other? Well, how about this one? God created human beings and then gave us a list of things. The list got ever bigger. And the invitation in that list was to do some things and to avoid doing some other things. And if we can get it right, if we can accumulate enough points, if we have a positive balance in our righteousness account, at the end of time, we will make it to heaven. The sad reality, however, is when it comes to human beings, the church follows more Augustine than it does Jesus. You see, Augustine used to believe that you and I were totally depraved creatures. And that if left to our own devices, we would spiral out of control and the world, the world would implode. Now, Augustine was partly right, but nothing is ever that simple. I think you know that already. Because human beings are paradoxes. As was beautifully prayed by my colleague Joey, a few moments ago. The church is both meek and mighty. Human beings are both the pinnacle of creation and its biggest threat. Now, when we talk about the story of who we are, and it comes to sin, reflecting our brokenness, we typically go to a particular text in Scripture. It's a helpful text, after all, when we're doing a baptismal study, it provides for an easy, clean answer when attempting to develop our understandings of what sin is. I'm of, I'm of course referring to 1 John chapter 3, verse 4. There, John says, sin, every, everyone who sins commits lawlessness because sin is lawlessness. Some other version says, everyone who commits sin transgression, transgresses because sin is the transgression of the law. 
And I think, again, that's partly right, but there's a nuance that needs to be understood. And in order to understand the nuance, what I want you to do with me this afternoon is turn your Bibles to John chapter 3. We're going to be looking at verse 1. Now, verse 1 begins with this statement. See what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. In order to explain this whole concept of sin, we have to start from the beginning. And in order to do that, I need to geek out with you on some Greek. Is that okay? Can we geek out, geek out on some Greek together this afternoon? There's like three people that are excited about Greek. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay, so for you three that are excited about Greek, in this whole passage that was read as our scripture reading this afternoon... There is only one command. And the command appears at the very outset of the passage. That word that your Bible translates as see is actually an imperative. It's a command. So what God is requesting his church to do through John is to see. And it's not see and consider in this mushy kind of sentimentalistic way where you're like, yeah, I, I see you. Rather, what John is trying to say is, hey, church, wake up. Pay attention. Forget everything else. This is what you need to focus on. Focus on this la with laser-like precision. And now that he has our attention, the church turns and says, what are we supposed to focus again? What is the command? The love that God has lavished upon us. When I read that this week, I was moved. Because all that God is asking me to do is to take some time to consider how much I am loved by him. And then he says that we should be considered children of God. My status as a child of God is a direct result of God's love for me. And I know you've heard it that before, but I want that to sink in, to become part of your sinews. You are a child of God because God loved you first. And I don't know how we miss this. I don't know how we continue to preach message after message where we say, God's grace is the response to our sin problem. As if God had this issue of sin that came up and said, well, I guess I have to be graceful. Grace isn't God's response to the sin problem. Grace is who God is. And he says, consider that, that you are my child. And what is truly revolutionary is that in the economy of heaven... The, perf the reward precedes the performance. The reward precedes the performance. That doesn't happen anywhere else. If you're a student, your grades will reflect how much you study. If you work for someone, your salary, your salary will be reflected by how many hours you work. But in the economy of heaven, the reward, your status as a child of God is independent of what you do to achieve that status. And I've been thinking all week of a analogy that I can use, perhaps, to illustrate that for you. And the best thing that I could come up with is something that I know you have seen. Uh, picture this, we're all sitting at a table, 
and we're surrounded by children. We're at a birthday party. And that table is packed high with goodies. You've got cake, pie, ice cream, muffins, brownies. And every single one of those child children is salivating over the prospect of eating this amazing food. And then mom and dad come into the room. And they come in and, you know, mom and dad are carrying a tray full of vegetables and you know what's coming next as your heart sinks and you're deflated and you say to yourself, <sighs> because you see it, you see that, bro that wilted broccoli, I'm going to turn over here because my health conscious friend is, is on this side of the room, you see this wilted broccoli, these yellowish carrots, and I still don't really know what kale is, but it's there. <laughs> and mom and dad say, yeah, eat your vegetables before you eat dessert. <sighs> but on occasion, not always, but every so often, mom and dad, mom and dad will put the tray to the side and say, today, because it's your birthday, you get to have dessert first. See what matter of love the Father has lavished upon us, that he lets you have dessert first. I know the analogy breaks down. If you don't like sweets, if you, in your case, the Lord lets you eat quinoa first and then the rest of your meal. So then the question becomes, what is sin? Well, I'd like to propose you, to you that sin is three primary things. First and foremost, sin is our refusal to recognize the relatedness that exists between God and us and between each other. You see, not only is it tragic that the church has more in common with Augustine than it does with Jesus, what is also tragic is that our understandings of performance and the Christian life are more in line with the Greeks than, we're, than they are with the gospel. Now, let me explain that to you. In Greek thought, perfection was an attribute that you could ascribe to an individual or an object. In other words, you had to strive to be perfect. And in order to strive to be perfect, you needed to prepare. But in the Hebrew mindset, the idea of perfection is a little bit different. You know, back in the beginning of time when God creates and he makes the heavens and the earth and all that is in them, and he says, it was tov, it was good. What, he is actually, what the author is actually talking about isn't perfection as something that exists inherent within us. Rather, for the authors of Scripture, perfection and goodness are related to the spaces that exist between us. Perfection and goodness live in the spaces between us. And what does that mean? Well, that means that perfection is not something I strive in. Perfection is something I live out in community. And when you think about that, it makes sense because ultimately what sin does is it frays your relationships with God and with each other. What sin does is it isolates you. What sin does is it makes you feel inordinate amounts of shame and shame causes you to separate. Sin is your refusal to recognize the relatedness that exists between you and God and between each other. But the text continues. So it's really interesting because if you read the grammatical construction of verse 1, you'll see something. You'll see the imperative, which is the primary clause. Behold what matter of love God has lavished upon us. Then you have a subordinate clause. And a result, as a result of this love, 
You are called a child of God. But then you have a conjunction, an adverbial conjunction, and that means that as a result of you being a child of God, something else happens. And it's right there in the second part of that text. You, you can read it in front of you. It says, because of this, the world will not know you, for the world did not, what? Know him. Well, if God wants to be known and wants to know you, then it makes sense that this idea of, to be, of knowledge and to be known is set in opposition to the world's idea of what it takes to be known. So how do you get known in the world? Well, you amass more, you consume more, you gain more influence. And God is saying, no, your status is independent of all of that because the reward precedes the performance. But that's not where the text ends. Verse 3. All who have this hope, i.e. the hope of Jesus, in him purify themselves just as he is pure. So after he settled out who we are, after he's given us our, mar our marching orders, he says, okay, now this is what you need to do. And he talks about purification. But again, purification is the result of possession. You possess a hope, th therefore you purify yourselves. And here's the problem with churches. We got it backwards somehow. Are you with me? We do you want to be a pure church? I should hear yes. So we're going to try that again. Do you want to be a pure church? Yes. Then make sure we're a hope-filled church. Because if we are not hope-filled, we can't be pure. Too often we focus on the purification when it's our job to live and breathe hope into people's lives. That's the purpose of church. Sin is opposition to grace. You know, grace, the best picture of grace, you know this. It's the father waiting at the door, tiptoes, cloak in his hand, signet ring ready. The whole staff at home is, is on standby because he might come today. And then he sees him, and he walks out, and he hugs and embraces him, covered in the slime of swine. That's grace. Sin is opposed to grace. Because sin says you need to take a bath before the Father will put the robe on you. It's breaking down these relationships that we are to have with one another. Sin is ultimately opposition to grace, dear friends. So you're asking, well, what about that oft-quoted text? You know, the text that we always hear when we're talking about sin. Anyone who commits sin commits transgression because... Sin is the transgression of the law. I have to geek out with you on Greek a little bit again. The NIV probably isn't the best translation of that particular verse. Because the word that appears in your Bibles as commit is a Greek word that, well, it's a Greek word poieo. And poieo doesn't really mean commit. Poieo means to make or to create. Poieo appears in the Greek translation of the Old Testament on the very, in the very first verse. You know the, you know the text. In the beginning, when God poieo, the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, when God created. See, God creates this world that is to be lived in harmonious relationships. 
Opposition to grace also creates something. It creates a world where I no longer see you as bearing the image of God. Rather, I see you as a thing that I can exploit. To sin, then, is to attempt to create an alternate reality that differs from the reality that God has called us to live in. And when we do this, we lose our capacity to adeptly reflect what the body of Christ is. I mean, look around you, folks. We are so diverse. I was racking my brain this week trying to think how I could describe our congregation. And I realized there is no way. And it is that diversity, that wealth, that allows us to more appropriately reflect what the image of God is. We need all of you. Sin, however, ultimately isn't just our refusal to relate with God. It isn't just our opposition to grace. Sin ultimately is, your, is our inability to go deeper. Ronald Rawheiser, a writer of religion, says that you and I living in this society are currently hurrying ourselves into spiritual oblivion. Microsoft conducted a study in 2013, and it noted that our attention span is a whopping eight seconds. Those of you who are still with me, thank you, you've made it. <laughs> because relationships take digging deeper, because understanding necessitates digging deeper, because grace needs deeper experiential realities. Now, the problem is we don't like exceptions. We actually do very badly with exceptions. This is why I used to hate the English language. Because any other sane language... You start with the rules, then you move on to the exceptions, right? Miguel, isn't that right? Miguel's shaking his head. English, that's not how it works. English, you start with the exceptions and you move over to the rules. And really, the rules don't really work because there's an exception to the exception to the rule. Which, led, which lends English to be a very interesting uh, for people who are not native speakers. I mean, think about this sentence. The soldier deserted his desert in the desert. That's an English word. Or how about this? The physician bound the, wo bound the wound around the wound. Or my personal favorite, Chris, you're going to love this one. The attorney objected to the object. English is all about the exceptions. And exceptions are great. Because see, what, what these exceptions do, what exceptions and language do, dear friends, is they force us to recalibrate. They force us to rethink. They force us to reinterpret. That's what digging deeper is about. It's about, our, it's about our capacity to hold within us the paradox. Or about our ability to deal with the exceptions. The truth of the matter is, universal laws which we love so much, they're great for science. They're really lousy for faith. So you might be thinking, okay, so what do I do? 
you know, sin, I get it. It's about relationships. I get it. I don't want to be opposed to, to grace. I understand. I want to just meditate on how much God loves me. But how do I do that? You know, C.S. Lewis, in that wonderful analogy about how the enemy thinks, the screw tape letters, has the senior demon reminding the junior demon that hell is a kingdom of noise. And I've been thinking this week, trying to figure out how it is that Jesus, the ultimate exception, that Jesus, the prime paradox, how did he deal with sin? And I realized that the way Jesus dealt with sin is in Scripture. Think about Luke chapter 4, right? Jesus is there. He hears the voice. This is my son. In him I am well pleased. And then Luke tells us that he was driven by the Spirit into the wilderness. And he spent 40 days... And 40 nights alone and without eating. And then Satan came to tempt him. And you know how I used to read the story? I used to say, man, that's so like Satan, right? He's going to tempt Jesus at his weakest. Jesus didn't go into the wilderness to test himself. Jesus went into the wilderness to strengthen himself. How do I know that? Because right after Jesus comes back to Galilee, heals a bunch, a bunch of people for a whopping one day, and then goes back into the wilderness. The way you confront sin is by engaging in a long-forgotten Christian practice called solitude. So as you came in this, week, uh, this morning, or this afternoon, you received a piece of paper that looks like this. Do you all have it? There we go. If not, we have some extras. And the point of this is uh, taking from the writings of Stephen Covey, Stephen Covey of Seven Habits of Highly Successful People fame, who states that the way you achieve inner peace is by finding harmony between your values and your schedules. And so what I want to do with you this summer, or rather what I want to invite you to do with me, is to develop a rule of life. So on one of the sides of your piece of paper, you'll find uh, the four ideas that we're going to be revisiting over this next summer. And there I simply want to invite uh, you to write some gleanings that you've had. Today we talked about sin. But then what I really want you to focus on is the other side of the piece of paper. What I want you to do there is I want you to consider that which is most valuable to you. And then I want you to think of some practices that speak to those values that you deeply have. And this week I want you to consider the practice of silence and solitude. Now I know it's complicated, I know it's difficult. I have kids who walk into my room at 5.30 every single day, Saturday, Sunday, 4th of July, National Day of Prayer, it doesn't matter, 5.30, they can go to bed at 1 a.m. in the morning, and at 5.30, they'll be at my door saying, Daddy, we're hungry. But the way we strengthen ourselves, the way we connect and we are known to God and then available to know each other is through silence. So before we close, I want to see if it's possible to have you close your eyes. Just close your eyes right there where you are. And I want you to think what it means to you to be a daughter or a son of God. And I want you to allow God's love to just wash over you. Just follow that commandment to consider how deeply loved you are. 
And then to those of you who are still struggling with this idea, I simply want to remind you, who you are is so much more important than what you do. You know, Ellen White, Ellen White sometimes catches a bad rap. I think Ellen White was an Adventist mystic. So I want to close with something she writes in Testimonies to the Church. Just keep considering God's love. Just stay in that space with God and listen to Sister White's words. It would be well to spend a thoughtful hour each day reviewing the life of Christ. From manger to Calvary, we should take it point by point and let the imagination grasp each scene. It's not just Calvary. It's the empty tomb and the second coming. It's your connection with Jesus. Consider how great the love of the Father is. Let us pray. The Protestant reformers, Lord, said that we are simultaneously just and sinners both beautiful and broken. We want to be known by you, but yet we continue to hide as we hear you walking in the garden in the coolness of day. And then we realize, we realize that your grace isn't a response to our sin, that your grace is, our, is your mode of being. And that the command that truly matters, at least in John's economy, is that we pause and silently consider how much you love us. And that it is that love that emboldens us to call ourselves your sons and your daughters. Let this church be a wealth of hope let this church recognize the value and care in every single one of those whom we encounter, for they bear your image. But more importantly, let us consider Jesus and Jesus crucified and Jesus resurrected and Jesus soon coming, we pray in his name. And all the people of God said, Amen.
Hello, everybody. So good to be back with you. I trust it's been a neat week for you, some celebrating, I suppose, when I realized I get to greet Christopher and Melanie Job this week, I knew it was bow tie week. Hello, Tara Johnson, Cala Mesa, California. Always glad to know about your birthday and this time get to see you with your cute kitty. Beverly Reeves, Banning, California, 78th birthday, Bev. Warmest congratulations and delighted to see you with brother David. Bob and Sandy Schmidt live in Hemet, California. They're marking their 60th anniversary as I see them bookending family members. William McDonald, Burtonsville, Maryland, 71st birthday for you, sir. All the very best and see you with wife Denise. Darlene Roado DeLog, a part of our family here. And happy birthday, lady. And glad to see you in this photo with husband Louie, daughter Ainsley, and son Blaine. Christopher and Melanie Job, a University Church family. 39th anniversary. There you were, and there you are, and now everybody knows why I call this bow tie day. James Campbell, Sacramento, California, 90th birthday. Congratulations, James, and glad to see you with Janice, and then daughters Merle and Colleen, surrounded by loving family. Bruce and Judy Yingling live in Healdsburg, California, and they mark their birthday on the same day. That's tomorrow. And I wish you two all the best. Jim Grindley, CUNA, Idaho, 88th birthday, Jim. We go clear back to Walla Walla days. And I wish you all the best with dear Sylvia there and then your children and grandchildren. Hello, Jocelyn Clark, 54th birthday for you right here. And always glad to be reminded as I see you with your daughters. Elmer Sakala, Redlands, California, 80th birthday, Dr. Sakala and happy, happy day, and see you there with Dara Lee. Joel Stahl lives in Oregon, Oregon, 86th birthday. Congratulations, Joel, as I see you with wife Norma, and then with loving family. Alma Johnson has a birthday, congratulations, and an anniversary the same day with Brother Melvin. Congratulations, 71st anniversary, and we go all the way back to Walla Walla College days. Hello, Bill Stone, Somerset, Kentucky, 85th birthday, sir. Congratulations, and glad to see you with beautiful Vienna. Dale Twomley, wow. Howard, Ohio, Dale, 84th birthday. Always glad to be reminded of you by Sister Elaine and to see you with dear Connie. Betty Manfred Simcock, Walla Walla, Washington, 62nd anniversary. Congratulations, you two, and glad to see you celebrating in the Tudor Fields of Skagit County, Washington. Kelly and Diane Bach, long, long time friends, 52nd anniversary for you two, and delighted to see you with your daughters. Julie and John Bruce, Longmont, Colorado, an anniversary again for you two. There you were, and there you are. Sharon and Marlon Dolinsky, 45th anniversary. Glad to remember when you were, when you are, and look at what 45 years have produced. Charles Schultz, Grand Terrace, California, lives part of the time in Nepal, working for Gospel Outreach. There he is with granddaughter Lily Clementine and two Nepalese girls he sponsors. Hello, Ellis Rogers. Happy birthday, man, 89th and delighted to see you with dear Jody. You two are very special. David Taylor, my classmate from Potomac University, 90th birthday, Dr. David, congratulations. Always glad to be in touch. Liviu Imber, lives now in Milan, Michigan. Happy birthday, sir, and delighted to see you with dear Claudia. Christian Leukert, a part of our family here at Loma Linda, had an, has an anniversary coming up right away, and also a birthday as he smiles over his loving family. Aaron Laudenslogger, look at this happy man, and then with his beautiful wife and enjoying this precious little daughter. Michael Weismeyer, Riverside, California, now at Southern Adventist University, where he is a history professor, and of course I'd expect him to be in a historic spot. Cheryl Coy Potter, Salome Springs, Arkansas. Hello, Cheryl. Always glad to be reminded of you. And there 
with granddaughter Kess. Anita Molstad, Hayden Lake, Idaho. Another Walla Walla history with us. And there you are on a winter hike with Brother Dick. And the same for Mike and Jan Bishop, Clackamas, California, Clackamas, Oregon. 35th anniversary. All the very best to you two as you were. And more recently, Peter and Yvonne Barkison, Ultawa, Tennessee, 57th anniversary. There they were and still very much in love. Marilyn and Bob Kasky, Colorado Springs, Colorado, 61st anniversary for you two, and we see you at your 50th anniversary, and then as you are. Hello, Sam Ocampo, St. Helena, California. Happy birthday, man. And with dear Gwen and three generations, your dad and your son. Ben Lau, Dr. Lau, Loveland University Church family, congratulations on your birthday, sir. Elena and Philip Milosavljevic, 14th anniversary. You two are so loved at the beginning there and more recently, and now with little Mila. Dr. Tito Naval, 84th birthday. Warmest congratulations and glad to see you at the piano. And Brian Hartnell, dear, dear friend, part of the University Church, having a birthday. Wish you all the best, Brian. Yes. So good to be with all of you. And I just trust us all into God's loving care. <laughs>